on this episode of the Naturist Living Show, Pubic Hair. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca Welcome, dear listener, to episode 63 of the Naturist Living Show. My name is Stéphane Deschain. I am your host for this podcast and this episode, and I'm also the owner of Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. It's January 2014, and uh, we're well into... Uh, What would be our sixth year now? It's been over five years since the show started. And uh, we are, I want to remind everybody that we are doing the second um, annual, hopefully, trip to Montalivet in France. If you're interested, it's time to book soon. Um, The uh, good pricing that we have is not guaranteed till the last minute. And uh, you have choices this year of two weeks or one week uh, and going to Paris or not. So all the details are available at bearoaks.ca slash France. I am announcing that we now take Bitcoins at Bear Oaks. Um, yeah, I'm sure everybody's heard something about Bitcoins. There's been a lot of news and a lot of talk about it. Uh, a lot of governments are concerned about the fact that it is a... Uh, a currency that can't be tracked and therefore is it has been used and uh, can be used for illicit activities and everything else. I'm not totally buying the whole idea that that's a problem. Uh, I mean, it's a, crime is a problem and illicit use is a problem, certainly. And But the fact is that cash has always been like that. Uh, when I spend cash and give it to you, there is nothing preventing you from just pocketing it and not reporting it to the government and not paying taxes on it. Um, so Bitcoin is really no difference. The, uh, the, the difference is that that's a virtual currencies and the government can't control, um, the monetary policy. So because it's not controlled by anyone and because it's not controlled by any government and there's no central authority, you can even argue that with, because it is, it's difficult to uh, explain, but it's basically a mathematical model and the uh, Bitcoin transactions are hosted and tracked by everybody that has a wallet. So in order for your transaction to be accepted, it has to be recognized by all the other wallets. So you you can maybe fake your transaction, but it'll be rejected by everybody else and therefore will never work properly. Oversimplification, but that's essentially how it works. So why are we taking Bitcoins? Well, we take Bitcoins because, well, it's kind of trendy and cool and I think it's interesting. So I thought, why not try it? Um, I don't expect a huge rush of uh people paying for accommodations or memberships or visits at Bear Oaks, but they can if they want to. Um, Similarly, I don't expect anybody to be buying things at the Bear Boutique with Bitcoins, but they can. And uh, it has advantages in that it's very, very, very easy to make payments. Um, As a merchant, it is way cheaper than credit cards, and you can send your money through the uh, internet very easily. So that's an advantage. It also has an advantage for uh, naturists who like to maintain anonymity. I mean, the, there's a lot of people who come to Bear Oaks who pay um, with uh, bank drafts and things like that because they're afraid that, you know, uh, people will know that they're naturists and it'll affect their job. And I understand that. I understand that's a fear. I don't know if it's really founded on anything because I haven't heard of anyone who's actually been fired or lost friends because of it. I've heard a lot of people say they think they will, but I haven't heard anybody who's actually had the problems, and I don't want anybody to have the problems, but I, I'm not sure if it's true or if it's just a fear that it might be true. At any rate, so if people want to maintain their anonymity, 
paying with bitcoins is a very good solution uh, because uh, there's while the transaction is tracked who is doing the transaction is not and so it would be quite complex to try to figure out who made the payment and uh, so if there's interest it's there if not well it didn't really cost anything to implement So hi, Felicity. How are things in New York? Hi, Stefan. Everything's good. Good. Yeah. Nice and hot? Yeah. <laughs> I said freezing. Oh, freezing. <laughs> oh, okay. Freezing and snowy. But hot inside your place. Yeah, warm enough. That's good. So um, today's show, I'm, I'm talking about pubic hair. So uh, I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting topic and it always comes up in the nature's um, circles because of the fact that you can see whether people shave or not when you go to a nature's place. Um, but f- from my experience, uh, people tend to be very opinionated about it. Even yeah, though, I, yeah. I, I, I've met, yeah, there's certainly two camps, right? There's people who say like it's uh, just really disgusting and that's why they shave it and others who say, well, you know, it's a lot of work and it's, and it's natural. I don't Right. And and what do you see on the blogs? What kind of discussions do you see? Well, um, I just see usually every time I bring up pubic hair on social media or on our website, I immediately, like immediately guys comment about what kind of pubic hair they prefer on a woman. Hmm. And uh, it just drives me crazy because I'm like, they, they just don't get it. Like for A, nobody cares. And B, it's like despite what you've been told that like women uh, all care about what you think about their appearance, like they really don't. It it doesn't matter. Yeah, well, I I guess to a certain extent, it's like you know, uh, I as you know from I have a big mustache, and some some guys have beards. Um, I guess it's a preference thing. Do you have an opinion for personally? For for mustaches and beards? Yeah, or for pubic uh, hair. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I'd have to get used to 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 a full beard. I've never had a, a boyfriend or anything with like a really full beard. Um, I don't I don't really care either way about that, and I don't have a uh, very. I just don't really care about pubic hair much either. I mean, for myself, I shave, and because that's how I don't like the way pubic hair looks, and and that's my personal preference. But I'm not gonna push that on anyone else. So when you say you don't like it, do you do you do you see other people with a uh, full bush and you think that's gross? No, just on myself. Oh, okay. I, I I'm totally you know everyone should do what they want with their pubic hair, and that's and that should be something that that um, is goes well with naturism. You know, it's it's about accepting people as they are and telling them they can do whatever they want with their body. So the fact that you're shaved is, is not because Jordan's pushing you that way. No, no, no. Uh, I don't. I don't think he he has very much preference. And you know, even if he said to me, "You have to shave," I'd be like, "F you! I don't wanna." <laughs> <laughs> That's right. What people say. People say that about my mustache. They say, "What does your wife think?" I say, "Well, I don't tell her how to cut her hair, so she doesn't tell me what to do with my mustache." You know. Right, and I. It sounds absurd, even uh, if you imagine people being so adamant about the hair on your head, like. They're like, no, long hair is disgusting. Everybody should have this short, cropped haircut. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, people say that on women who, you know, having a hair on their legs. And I, you know, I've seen women with hair on their legs. And I don't think it's a big deal. I've seen women with hairy armpits. It, does, it doesn't gross me out. But some people get a very visceral reaction to it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I just, like, I, I do plan to write about it on the YNA site. And I literally want to be like, if you comment, just to say what your preference is, I'm going to delete it. <laughs> <laughs> this drives me crazy. But, yeah, you know, I know and people are people seem to be pretty concerned um, who are new to it, who, who are wondering, well, what does everybody do? You know, I don't want to be the only person with like a whole bush of pubic hair and the odd man out. But um, really, like I when I do take notice of it, I I see everything. I see, you know, people who who trim. I see people who are shaved. I see people who are completely unshaved. So, I mean, there's a, there's an obvious trend toward being shaved, but um, the last 
event I went to here, like I really saw all kinds. Well, I, you know, it, it's funny because I, we've met and I didn't, I couldn't remember until you said it, whether you were shaved or not. So to me, it wasn't a big deal. I, I guess it's, I know. <laughs> it, it's, it's worth the discussion since some people have such a strong opinion, but it's hopefully it's not a big issue that we're going to spend a lot of time yeah. on, you know, I mean, right. anything more important happening in your world that you're working on? Yeah. Um, we actually have been talking about this public lands petition that that was started um, about two weeks ago, I guess. Uh, have you seen it? The whitehouse.gov petition? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. It got passed around a little bit here and there. It does. It, last time I looked, it didn't have a lot of signatures on it. No, it has about, as of today, it has almost uh, 2,500 signatures. And you need like 100,000 to get somewhere, right? Isn't that the yeah, works? Yeah, that's the idea. Um, I mean, the petition, if if, you, if listeners haven't seen it, it's, it's a petition that aims to, quote-unquote, designate portions of wilderness public lands under management of the National Park Service, Bureau of Land Management, and U.S. Forest Service for clothing-optional recreational use. Hmm. And when, so did it, they, when did it start? Uh, it started, it's a month. They have a month. When you do a petition on the site, you have a month to get 100,000 signatures. So um, they have until February 12th. Okay. And so, yeah, we're at the end of January right now. So hopefully the end of podcast will be out by the end of January. Yeah, yeah. So why do you think the numbers are so low? Because I saw this morning in the news that uh, the kick Justin Bieber out of the United States <laughs> is almost at 100,000. I know. <laughs> I saw that too. Um well, it was funny because I was contacted by a reporter just yesterday asking about the petition, and they were taking it as a sign that, oh, there really isn't in very much interest in nudism anymore, and there really aren't that many nudists because this petition is really not doing well. And so I was trying to convince her that it's not evidence oh. <laughs> that nudism is, is not doing well. But um, I think that a lot of people just don't aren't even taking the petition seriously. and. I wouldn't blame them because a lot of the petitions on this website are not taken seriously. Like you just said, that Justin Bieber petition. Right. <laughs> I don't think that uh, Obama is going to address that one, even if it gets 100,000 signatures. And then there are petitions that get uh, less than 100,000 signatures, and the White House will address that. So it's like they just pick and choose which ones to respond to. Yeah. And that, see, that's always the problem. I think naturists are not g getting their voice heard. We know we could easily get 100,000 signatures uh, if everybody got involved, but naturists yeah. don't speak up. And so the politicians don't think they have to pay any attention to us. That's true. We we do. like We need a way to, to get our voices heard. I, I don't think this is the way to do it. Um, I we 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 tweeted it and we promoted it a little bit, but we really didn't put much effort to it because I honestly just didn't see a point. No, um, no, because you're right; they probably wouldn't do anything about it because it's not really a federal thing anyway, is it? Right. Um, no, not really. I mean, there there's no there's no currently no federal law that prohibits nudity on public lands. Um, but you know, and I'm I'm not that political, but I don't think that this is going to be the way that we get. Uh, clothing optional areas on on public lands. No, I can't you know? imagine a State of the Union address where you know, know. Obama says, <laughs> right. "My fellow Americans, I have decided to designate one beach every 100 kilometers. Oh, <laughs> yeah. sorry, 100 miles, because United States." <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just a little absurd. I don't know, but I mean, the Nature's Doctrine Committee also like put out an advisory about it, and they they weren't even like, "Oh, everybody should be signing this." They said. Uh, you know, it's well written and, and it wasn't made with uh, our collaboration or anything. And basically they said, we leave it up to the individual whether or not they sign it. Okay. Okay. Well. So, you know, they weren't really fully endorsing it. And at that point I was like, well, uh, now I don't, I don't really have a real reason to like put all my effort into putting this out there. Yeah. Do you know who started it? Uh, yes. Yeah, this guy named Larry Darter. He actually has a, a – he writes about nudism for examiner.com. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I yeah, saw that. Yeah, he's probably seen his stuff. Yeah. Hmm. 
Well, I hope it, uh, it'd be great if it worked. Um, I know. I, I would be, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I, I would be ecstatic if I were wrong, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I hope it works. But uh, it, it, it the danger, to... if it doesn't work, as you said, it, the reporters are going to go, see, nobody's interested. So that's the downside of it. I know. I know. I mean, it's good that it's good in that it creates a uh, conversation around this topic. Mm-hmm. But that's. That seems to be as good as it as it's for. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Anything else happening? What's YNA up to right now? Um, well, we actually just had an event this past weekend. We did our raw chocolate meditation night, which is really nice. And we actually have our Women's Day coming up on February 9th, which we're doing with Beth Nolan at this um, salon and spa in New Jersey. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's going to be a women women only event, and we are going to have discussions and yoga. And then uh, people, women, will be able to get whatever salon uh, spa treatments they want. So it's just going to be like a fun, relaxing day. Well, that sounds cool. Good. And you know, we're now getting it's past December, so every day is getting longer, and it doesn't feel like it, but we're going to be getting warmer soon. Right, soon enough. <laughs> It will be spring and summer, and we'll be outside again. And what's YNA going to be doing this summer and spring? Any plans? Um, we don't. We haven't really started working on our summer schedule yet, um, but we will be doing uh, outdoor gatherings at, at nudist clubs and uh, Gunnison Beach, I hope, and, and other places. Good. And I, I hear from uh, talking to Joshua f- f- as a follow up to that uh, nude spa that things are moving forward. I don't think he'd want me to give a lot of details, but it sounds like he's got a potential location and that you guys might be helping. Yeah. Yeah. We are. We have been talking to him about it. Um, we're, we're still discussing it with uh, with the people selling a place, um, but hopefully it, it'll work out and we might have a, a place that might not be fully naturist, but it might be naturist on two days a week, like throughout the year. Well, that's very exciting, actually. Yeah. So, as we discussed at the beginning of the show, today's topic is pubic hair. And, uh, you know, I don't know why that's a topic. It, it kind of happened by accident. The uh, main interview that we have at the end of the show um, was on topic of pubic hair, and a few other things came together to really make this the central theme for today's show. And uh, it's um, it shouldn't be a big issue in the naturism. I mean, I if anybody's seen my pictures, you know I have a very big mustache. I have So I have some facial hair. That's a personal choice. Some people don't. Uh, some people have long hair on their heads, some people have short hair, some people shave their armpits, some people shave their legs. So what you want to do with pubic hair is your choice. It's understandable that within a naturist environment, people might uh, style more um, in their pubic hair as well, because that's another hair that is visible. Um, I've been clear that my personal preference is um, to not be completely bare, because to me that's uh, prepubescent, um, and I, from the time I grew up, that's not what I was used to, but I don't have a problem with it, and if that's what people want to do, great for them. That's their choice, and we shouldn't really have a debate, but I do hear a lot of debates over it. People have argued this. Is it sexual? Is it inappropriate? Is it not natural? Well, you know, um, your pubic area is in the sexual organs area, but we are in naturism, we're used to all body parts being equal and not emphasizing excessively that area. You could argue that having pubic hair puts more emphasis on it, although that's more natural, so maybe that's more naturist. Does it really matter? Um, You know, what's completely natural means I would never shave and never cut my hair, perhaps never wash. I mean, there's a limit as to what is natural. But it certainly has been the trend, not just in naturism, we're just more aware of it because we see it, it has been the trend that uh, pubic hair is shaved, um, mostly for women, but for men as well. And it was interesting because we played the vagina monologue in the previous episode, uh, which was performed at Bear Oaks last summer. And the show was so well received and they got so many uh, compliments that that word got to the Bear Necessities folks and the... uh, the cast was invited to perform um, on the uh, the nude cruise that's coming up. 
The cruise is aboard the uh, New Amsterdam. Uh, it's February 9th through 16th. And uh, there will be two performances, and it's in uh, celebration of V-Day, which happens around around and close to uh, Valentine's Day, which is V-Day, but also V for Vagina, because it's the Vagina Monologues. And during the Baroque's performance, they, they, they selected a few of the uh, monologues, but not all of them. However, for the cruise, they are performing an extra one. They are performing the uh, monologue called Hair. You cannot love a vagina unless you love hair. My first and only husband hated hair, and many people do not love hair. He said it was cluttered and dirty. He made me shave my vagina. It felt all puffy and exposed, and like a little girl, this excited him. When he made love to me, my vagina felt the way a beard must feel. It felt good to rub it and painful, kind of like scratching a mosquito bite. <laughs> it felt like it was on fire, and there were screaming red bumps. I refused to shave my vagina again. Then, my husband had an affair. We went to marital therapy. He said he screwed around on me because I refused to shave my vagina and please him sexually. The therapist, who had a thick German accent and gasped, oh, between sentences, oh, to show her empathy, asked me, oh, why you don't want to please your husband and shave your vagina? I told her I thought it was weird. I felt little down there when my hair was gone and I couldn't help talking in a baby voice and uh, got real irritated and even calamine lotion couldn't help it. She said, marriage is a compromise. I asked her if shaving my vagina would stop him from screwing around. I asked her if she had many cases like this before. She said, Oh, questions dilute the process. You need to jump in. She felt it was a good beginning. Later, when we got home, he got to shave my vagina. It was like a therapy bonus prize. <laughs> he uh, clipped it a few times, and there was blood in the bathtub. He didn't even seem to notice he was so happy to be shaving me. Later, when he pressed up against me, I could feel his spiky sharpness sticking into me. My naked, puffy vagina. There was no protection. There was no fluff. I realized then that hair is there for a reason. It's the leaf around the flower. It's the lawn around the house. <laughs> you gotta love hair in order to love the vagina. You don't get to pick the parts you want. And besides, he never did stop screwing around. Now, that performance is not by the cast, the uh, Baroque's Players, um, which, by the way, the Baroque's Players have their own blog. If you are interested in following them or attending or joining them as a theater group, it's a newly formed group that's going to perform other shows at Baroque's. But that's aside uh, from that. Um, this particular uh, version of the Medina Monologue was performed in uh, Victoria, B.C. Uh, for V-Day in uh, 2008. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't have any information as to who the performer is, uh, although she did a very good job. That particular uh, performance of uh, the Vagina Monologues in 2008 raised over $30,000 for the Women's Transition House in Victoria, B.C., so these things are always for a very good cause. So the question is, you know, this trend, um, 
is it changing? Uh, all trends do. It's a fashion. To shave all your hair is a fashion. Um, it, it, there was a time where pubic hair was obscene. If you look at the really old magazines from the 30s and 40s, the naturist magazines, they all look like uh, Ken and Barbie because you couldn't show men's penises um, and you couldn't show women's pubic hair because, of course, you can't actually see women's genitals when they're standing normally. So it was all airbrushed out. It's not that the women were shaved, it's that they were airbrushed out. So the pubic hair itself was obscene. Um, and, you know, through then it was normal to have pubic hair. Everybody had pubic hair. Shaving it was kind of unusual. I think it became kind of a thing in pornography for people to be shaved, and that kind of caught on, and it became a trend. Uh, now I hear young people say that, you know, pubic hair is dirty, um, and gross and and you hear that about armpit hair and leg hair on women um it's an interesting opinion we all have hair i'm not sure why it's gross and dirty in terms of pubic hair perhaps it's because um in our society people think that genitals are dirty if genitals are dirty then maybe pubic hair are dirty and certainly uh, if you keep you know that area all confined in a hot wet dark damp environment it's all kind of get smelly and stuff and gross but in a naturist environment, it's just open to the air, like your, the hair on your head. I'm not sure why it should be any more gross. So pubic hair maybe is now coming back into fashion because any fashion goes one way and then it goes way back the other. That's almost uh, guaranteed and very predictable. Um, and certainly uh, there's been some stuff in the news recently. Um, uh, actor uh, Cameron Diaz uh, has a new book called The Body Book. And she has a whole section entitled In Praise of Pubes. Gwyneth Paltrow did an appearance on the uh, Ellen DeGeneres show where she talked about her pubic hair. Change there, and I went and I couldn't wear underwear. I don't think I can tell this story well, on you, TV. Now you've told it. Well, I, let's, let's just say everyone went scrambling for a razor. <laughs> you certainly don't take care of yourself if you're... <laughs> I mean, the, the, it was just the side of your leg. What? I work a 70s vibe, you oh. know what I mean? Oh, got it. <laughs> a 70s vibe. <laughs> so I guess having pubic hair is a retro trend. And uh, sure, why not? You know, we have retro everything else. So a uh, retro pubic hairstyle now as well. Um, 70s pubic hair. I guess, unless you talk about it in most uh, environments, you wouldn't know about it. It could be something you can uh, probably talk about and, and people can see in a nature's environment. And there was an article even in the Huffington Post that reported that uh, the uh, American Apparel in uh, New York City on Houston Street had mannequins in the window that had pubic hair. And if you see the pictures, I'll put a link to it in the show notes. It's a lot of pubic hair. I mean, we're talking about a big bush here. So maybe it's cool, maybe it's a trend. Maybe the next thing is lots of pubic hair will be the end thing. So all this discussion about pubic hair was started because we have a new correspondent. Joshua Williams, who uh, you'll know because we discussed uh, last show, or the previous show, we discussed his idea for a nature spa in New York City. And uh, he also did the, uh, he's a fashion professor, and he discussed fashion and nudity and naturism as well uh, when, a couple of years back at this point. And uh, he, um, him and I have kept in touch, and we've become friends, and we've seen each other a few times at Bear Oaks and in New York, where he lives. And he was interested to do interviews uh, for the show, which is great. I, from the beginning, my thought was that it would be other correspondents recording interviews with interesting people all around the world. And so far, uh, I've been doing almost all of it. And uh, he's de he decided to do this interview. And uh, he interviewed the woman who is behind the Bear to Bush website. Uh, she basically shaved her pubic hair and then documented the regrowth. And it's not as boring as it sounds. She actually makes some very uh, interesting observations and, and keen insights about a societal attitude towards uh, the human body in general and women and that kind of thing. So it's a very insightful uh, blog, and uh, it's got some really, uh, really good photography as well, or some of it may be shocking to some. Uh, the photo that is the, uh, uh, the, the theme photo for the show came from her blog, and of course I had to censor it when I posted it on Facebook. Um, and uh, so 
she didn't want to her name used and she didn't want her voice used because she's trying to maintain anonymity. She doesn't want the, sh- the, the blog and the story to be about her. Um, so what uh, Joshua did is he interviewed her uh, through text and uh, the transcript because of that is available as a link from the show notes. And uh, then she, uh, Joshua read the questions and Katie, uh, his wife, recorded the voice of the Bear to Bush author. It's great to be on the Nature's Living show today in the role of an interviewer. I've appreciated my many conversations with Stefan on and off this podcast. A few months ago, I came across a very interesting Tumblr blog called Bear to Bush, which describes the project rather perfectly. On September 16th, 2013, a woman decides to shave off all of her pubic hair and then follow its regrowth through words and images on the internet. And while it sounds completely sophomoric, The reality is that the journey, if you will, has been rather profound, an opportunity to consider her own body and open open up a conversation with other women and even men about bodies in general, the good and the bad. I'm pleased to have had a conversation with the founder and writer of the blog and now the website BearToBush.com. However, as the blog is written anonymously, we chose to have the conversation via chat and then use the transcript to record an interview with another woman's voice. Of course, we discuss the reason for this anonymity in the interview, but we also delve into discussions related to nudity, sexuality, body acceptance, and of course, body hair. So what was the genesis for this rather unique project? Honestly, I was bored one day, so I shaved my pubic hair. I've always thought it's funny how people have Tumblr blogs about ridiculous things that seem like no one would care, so I got into my head to create a blog where I followed the regrowth of my pubic hair, just out of pure boredom, and to entertain myself. Sort of like how people say it's as boring as watching paint dry. I figured it would be a fun, boring photo journal of hair growing back. And of course, Tumblr allows you to do something like that, unlike other social media platforms. Did you feel like there was something you could prove by doing it for yourself or even others? Not really. I mean, I wish I could say that this was all a premeditated platform from which to reach out and talk to people about their bodies. That's totally not what I intended. I really just did it for fun and figured I'd just have a couple of people following me who thought it was funny or simply wanted to see pictures of a girl's crotch. And I'm sure those uh, there are those that visited the, the blog for that very reason. Um, so at what point do you think it took on a different dimension? I think the first time I really realized that it was having an impact was when I made a post about the reality of nude photography. I had no idea it would explode the way it did. I just had it in my brain that I wanted to show people that all of the self-shot images they see are still posed and carefully positioned, and that the body can be so different depending on how it's posed. I made that post, thought nothing of it, except maybe being happy it turned out so well, and four hours later, it had already reached well over 2,000 people. Right now, I think it has something like 103,000 notes on it. That made me realize I had accidentally started saying things that people really related to. And with the popularity of the selfie and self-awareness in general, it really seemed to connect with, with readers on many different levels? Absolutely. The internet is so full of self these days, but so many people don't realize that those people posting photos still only post their best pictures, their best self. People think that because something's not commercial, it's somehow more natural, but that's not really the case a lot of times. I would say that most people who post all of those self shots, even something like a Facebook profile photo, post only their absolute best angles, which aren't really indicative of how they look in real life. There's an artifice to these pictures then, and and all the while do you think that women, even men, crave something more real, even when they create the best angle shots for Facebook? You know, it's interesting. I think there's definitely been a big push for more real or natural things lately. There are so many companies who switch their branding to attempt showing diversity in body types, more natural look, etc. But it's kind of bizarre because even with all of the real things we're seeing lately, they're still generally polished to be their best version of that. The real models are still symmetrical, attractive, shot with studio quality lighting, and people who know what they're doing. So yes, I do think that people are craving something real, and while it seems like we're getting that through media and selfies and all of this, I sometimes wonder if it's sometimes just a different version of the best angle. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't know if I explained that very well. No, perfectly. Makes sense. To a certain degree, humans want to see the ideal rather than the real. I think this has been the case in art for centuries, much before fashion magazines, probably. And, and what did you? Uh, and what about when you added the nude component? This uh, nudity obviously changes the dy dynamic to some degree. I would think nudity is such a bizarre element because, on one hand, it's such a simple, easy concept. I mean, hello, we're all born naked, and it's also so polarizing and taboo. I think that within the realm of nudity, people are possibly even pickier about making sure things look perfect. No one wants to admit their breasts sag a little or that they have weird hair on their stomach. If they've got a birthmark on their arm or something, it probably wouldn't be as big of a deal because they're used to seeing it and it doesn't matter. But if it's something that's usually covered by clothing and then revealed only to your partner, it has a different kind of feeling behind it, I suppose. I definitely used to agonize over how I looked while naked, so I can certainly relate. Hmm, that's a very interesting point. The uh, the revelation from clothed to naked is often more titillating than the nudity itself. It's the tension there. Definitely. I've read interviews from people who've done life modeling for schools, and they always comment about how the weirdest and most revealing part is the moment when they take off their robe and get naked for the first time in front of a group. The grand unveiling of the form. Once they've been naked for a while, it's not such a big deal. <laughs> but you mentioned your feelings for your own nude body. Um, this project certainly allows you to perceive your body in a different perspective than perhaps you did prior to this. What was your relationship with your body, and can you speak to any changes you've experienced over the past few months? Um, I've had a lot of different relationships with my body. When I was a kid, I didn't notice it. It was just what it was. And then as a teenager, I despised it. I was never skinny enough, pretty enough, and so on. The standard teenage dilemma. As I got older, some of those things started slipping away, and some of them held on longer than others. I still have issues here and there, but it's very rare. As far as how this project has changed me, I guess it's kind of solidified the, hey, my body is actually totally okay, and I'm good with it, <laughs> feeling that's been growing inside of me for a while. But honestly, aside from being a giant internet pat on the head, I feel basically the same now in regards to my body as I did before I started the project. <laughs> Fair enough. So out of curiosity, have you ever experienced social nudity or being nude in front of others or only on the internet? Yeah, I've been naked in front of people before. I've been to a couple of nude beaches and that was always interesting. Interesting, I guess, in that there was nothing weird or surprising about it for me. It was like, oh, cool, I won't get tan lines. There's a guy over there staring at my butt. Whatever, I have a nice butt. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your self-confidence uh, and, and matter-of-factness that comes across in your blog as well. Um, you've, ch you've chosen to stay anonymous, uh, which is, as you point out on your website, is really less about divulging your identity uh, and more about allowing women to relate with you. Can you can you speak to that a little bit more? Yeah, that's been an interesting decision. I mean, I started anonymously, anonymously with no intention of showing my identity. Of course, I wasn't incredibly careful about it because I figured I'd only have a handful of people paying attention to me. Once I started receiving recognition, I started panicking like, what if someone finds out who I am? <laughs> what would happen? Should I just out myself now and get it over with? <laughs> But of course, I calmed down and realized that one, that's not likely. Mm -hmm. Two, it wouldn't matter anyway. And three, being anonymous is actually a great way to allow people to relate to me. Yeah, interesting. I think that when we see other people, we immediately associate them with things. If someone saw my face, the reaction might be, oh, well, whatever, that girl's, that girl's pretty. Why is she talking about her body when she has no reason to complain? Or maybe, maybe oh, weird, she looks like so-and-so and I hated that girl. And that would shut people down and limit their own ability to see themselves in my writing and my pictures. You wouldn't believe how many women have written to me telling me that we have almost identical bodies. And if I showed my face, I'd lose that sort of, uh, sort of open door mm -hmm. I could be anyone feeling. Suddenly I would become a person instead of just a body or an idea. Wow. So in a way, it's, uh, this anonymity has provided a more open communication with others. Absolutely. I think that had I shown my face from the start, the project would never have gained as much momentum, mm. or at least not with the same kind of body positivity crowd. I may be wrong, of course, but at this point, I'm pretty stuck on my decision to remain anonymous. It's a trick, uh, you know, that many fashion companies use on the web for e-commerce by not showing the face of the model. 
the consumer is less likely to judge a piece of clothing based on the model wearing it. Out of curiosity, do you do you think your family and friends would be accepting of the project if they knew? Uh, yes and no, or rather no and yes. <laughs> no to family, yes to friends. Some of my friends do know, and the conversation usually goes something like, yeah, so I did a thing on the internet where I'm taking pictures of my body, and it's sort of popular now, and it's kind of weird but cool, and I like it. <laughs> and their response okay. is, cool, weird, whatever, want to play <laughs> pinball or something? I do have some friends who are really supportive and let me talk to them about it, but for the most part, no one who I've told cares at all or is ever surprised. Okay, that's interesting. My family, on the other hand, would be a different story if they found out. I was raised in a very conservative Christian household, so that's not really something that they would be proud of, even if I am helping people feel better about themselves. Now, is that because of the nudity, the topics you discuss, or, or both? Both. And also that I'm showing my naked body to the world for anyone to see. Pretty much everything to do with my project is a huge violation of how I was raised. I can appreciate that coming from a very conservative Christian household myself. Um, you mentioned in a post your limited information about uh, vulvas, vaginas, genitalia as a younger girl. Do you, do you think that's normal for most girls? And how does that affect their self-image and even their relationships later on in life? And, and were you able to see regular women nude growing up? Or was that also a violation uh, to what was perceived as right? Unfortunately, I do think that it's pretty normal for young girls. The amount of emails I get through Tumblr from women who tell me how much my story parallels theirs is astonishing. Hmm. I think that usually when kids get to see nudity, it's on TV, if anything, and it's movie star nudity, which is a whole lot different than naked person in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I definitely think that this hurts women later in life because they're never really sure what their body is supposed to look like and live in some sort of fear that it won't match up with the idea that the person they're with has about the female body. I'm sure that extends to men too, to a degree, but I also think it's a lot more acceptable for a little boy to run around naked with another little boy than for a little girl to say, hey, let's spread our legs and look at each other's genitals. Yeah, you're probably right. I never saw a naked woman growing up. I never even saw my mother naked. It was a clothing at all times household. You bathed by yourself if you were naked. Even swimming, I wasn't allowed to wear a revealing swimsuit to call any sort of attention to my body. I'm assuming then that nudity was tied explicitly to sexuality then, uh, even if that wasn't communicated directly. And uh, ultimately, that wasn't a positive message. You hope to a certain degree that your blog helps women or even girls to see a bit of reality that isn't sexually charged? Yeah. It was the whole nudity equals sex idea and also the God wants you to cover your body idea, neither of which I think are healthy for a young person growing up and learning about their own body. I do hope that my blog helps people see a little slice of reality that stands outside the world of porn and sex and celebrity and is just an open, honest portrait of a woman who's gone through the same things they're going through. And even if they can't talk to their mom about it or their friends about it, it's a little affirmation that there is someone out there who understands what they're going through mm -hmm. and made it out on the other side and still learning and growing. I've had countless emails from young women who told me they burst into tears when they started reading my blog because they felt like they finally found someone who understood their pain or what they were going through. One of my most incredible emails to date was from a girl struggling with anorexia who said she'd been through countless treatments for it and nothing ever helped. But somehow, reading through my words and seeing another woman so comfortable with herself gave her just a little bit of hope enough to reach out for treatment again. That absolutely breaks my heart. That women aren't finding this support anywhere else in their lives but I am glad that they're able to find some sort of solace in what I talk about, even if it just makes them feel better for that one hard afternoon when they come home from school after a hard day or something. Mm, it's amazing, especially when you consider uh, why you started your blog in the first place. It wasn't necessarily a serious thing, but I, I suppose it illustrates the need out there for honest conversation about bodies and, and even sexuality to a certain degree. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, your posts are very devoid of artifice. They're very honest uh, in a sense, in the sense that you show and tell it like it is, you've included shots of hairs on your nipples. You've talked about your anus. You have pictures of menstruation and then conversations about your period. And all of these are really common events, but 
still rather taboo to discuss, let alone show. So what made you choose to, to show or discuss these things and, and even say uh, something, if I remember correctly, uh, on one of your blogs, you said, I think it, meaning the bleeding, makes me powerful and strong. Is it easier to be honest about these particular issues when you're anonymous? Um, I think I'm a pretty honest about this stuff, even when I'm not anonymous. I'll have a discussion with friends about our bodies or their strange sexual fantasies or show them my ingrown hairs. <laughs> Obviously, I don't go around just blurting this stuff out to strangers. But if someone came up to me at a grocery store and said, are you on your period? How does that make you feel? I probably wouldn't even ask, why would you ask me that? I would just think about it for a second <laughs> and figure out how I felt and then tell them. <laughs> There are part, some parts of my body that I'm still a little squeamish about or feel weird about, but I've realized that talking about it is the easiest way to get over it. It's funny because a lot of times I don't know what I'm going to say about a picture at all. I just take a picture of something, my period, for example, and then I put it on my computer and stare at it for a bit and then start writing. Sometimes I know what I want to say, but more often than not, it just starts pouring out of me and I realize how I feel as I'm writing it. Hmm, interesting. So in a way, it, it's a learning process for you as well. I, I was reading through your blog. I noticed that one of the topics that seemed to create the most buzz, uh, if you will, out there was related to women's armpit hair, uh, especially when Nerve wrote an article about you. Why do you think that caused such a stir? And why particularly with women, as you point out? That was an interesting discovery. I have definitely received more strange looks from women in daily life in regards to my armpit hair than from men, which is what I talked about further back on my blog. But the Nerve and Reddit comments came from a lot of men too, I think. It's like people have this bizarre misconception that women either aren't supposed to grow armpit hair, that it's unnatural, which is crazy because it's absolutely natural, or that it makes a woman gross and unhygienic. Mm -hmm. It was actually really eye-opening for me to see that much hate generated about that topic because I exist in a somewhat protected bubble when you think about it. The people who follow my Tumblr follow it because they like me and what I'm doing. They share it with their friends who also like the same things and so on. But when my pictures, not even ones targeted at my armpits, just ones that showed it as a part of a different topic, found their way to the internet at large, it was a sudden surge of negativity and hate about my hair. It was kind of a wake-up call that this little world I'm in where everybody is pretty supportive and happy and positive is in no way a representation of how everybody actually feels about these things. Wow. So, And what's really interesting is that hair is really the main topic of your blog, body hair. And as a naturist, it's been interesting to see the evolution of body hair, especially pubic hair. Um, it's pretty normal now to see men and women of all ages without pubic hair on the beach or at the naturist club. Why do you think that society has such an aversion to hair there? Or I mean, why this conversation? Why this uh, either strong positivity or strong negativity? I really can't figure that out. I mean, sure, I could say it's all the media or the desire to look youthful or a big scam by razor companies and it's all marketing. But I don't know if I believe those things. Or maybe it's just a combination of all of those things. Or maybe none of them. I think the good news is the aversion seems to be dissipating, which I think is a good thing. It seems like it's somewhat okay now for women to have pubic hair. But then again, maybe I'm biased because I exist in a little pocket bubble of the internet, perhaps similar to a naturist being surrounded by like-minded people. Right. Where it's okay. Right, right. Well, I'm not opposed to body hair or even, you know, no body hair at all, having it shaved off. Uh, I think ultimately it's a personal preference and... And often uh, one that I choose to approach differently depending on my own mood. But, but going back a little bit, I'm curious if there's been differences in responses from women and men to your blog. Uh, not a big difference, I don't think. I would say that the majority of my following is female, but I have no real way to analyze or prove that. I get emails from both parties, and they seem to be shockingly similar. Hmm, okay. I think men deal with a lot of these things, too, either from a different angle or a different point of view, but similar things nonetheless. Men have told me they adore it when their partner doesn't shave. Women have told me they hate shaving. Both have told me I'm awful and disgusting and need to buy a razor. <laughs> I think the reaction is similar regardless of gender. So there's a lot of stark contrast then. I think with the internet, you always get more contrast. 
the people who don't really have an opinion just scroll past it with no opinion. It's the ones who want to either praise you or yell at you who take the time to write. Right, right. As you've alluded to, our society has a lot of mixed up feelings about nudity in general, particularly social nudity. Uh, as such, a lot of effort has been put into separating nudity from sexuality, which which makes sense. When I visit a naturist club or beach with my family, the last thing I want to see is sexual activity. But sometimes I think we try a little too hard to disconnect the two and, and, and therefore demonize sexuality. Uh, you were asked about whether or not you were comfortable with the idea that people might masturbate when looking at your blog, and I was very interested by your answer. Can you discuss that a little bit more, and and maybe how sexuality plays a role in body acceptance or, or being honest with your body? Yeah, that's a question that I get a lot, and one of my favorite types of emails actually are from men who feel the need to apologize to me <laughs> oh. because they found my blog and started masturbating to a photo or two and then started reading the text and ended up so on board with what I was saying that they felt guilty for using my images uh, for self-pleasure. <laughs> I totally get what you're saying about almost demonizing sexuality and separating nudity from it entirely. I think that the things don't need to be completely separate. You can see a naked body and be turned on by it, and it doesn't make you a bad person or a creep or anything. Sexuality is such a complicated topic, there's no way I could hope to really know and understand it, but in my own experience, it is tied into nudity, even if we want to pretend it's not. There's a vulnerability that happens when you're naked, so that's that's so different than when you're clothed that it's natural to have different feelings when you're naked and looking at someone naked. Mm-hmm. I guess I don't think that sexuality is evil. I don't think nudity is evil. I don't think that combining the two of them is evil. If someone uses my photos or my body to masturbate to, good for them. (laughs) They know what they like and they pleasure themselves and can go back to whatever life they're living. I see no harm in that. I think that nudity doesn't have to be sexual. And I've been in situations where it certainly isn't. But I don't think it needs to be completely removed from sexual feelings either. Hmm. And I guess I should clarify, those emails aren't some of my favorites because they're apologizing to me, but rather because they are just such honest accounts of a confused person, and it's incredibly endearing and somehow flattering. (laughs) Well, that was actually my next question. So the reality is that, you know, I guess context is everything, whether or not someone is clothed or nude. Absolutely. There are people in my life who I can take a naked bath in front of, and it's completely non-sexual, for me anyway. And then there are people who I feel sexually charged around just when I take off my jacket. (laughs) Well, and of course, intent is part of that as well. Uh, One of the questions you get from many would-be naturists is if seeing people nude might alleviate desire. It definitely takes away a sexual trigger and forces you to rethink sexuality, but I think in a positive way. Imagine, you know, what effect that would have on advertisers. Um, One of my favorite posts is when you comment about your period being a chance to reflect on what other private pain others are suffering. It seems that in many ways, this project has provided you an opportunity to uh, gain inside empathy and empathy. And I'm also reminded of two two posts in particular. One was your commentary on uh, Casey Edwards' letter um, about uh, fat, being fat, uh, or at least her mother. Uh, And then also Charlotte Roche's book, Wetlands. I like those posts, too. They're usually the ones that I feel really emotional about on a personal level. I wrote the commentary about Casey Edwards and then panicked because I realized it was maybe too personal or didn't fit with my project. But after a little while, I realized everything I do is personal when it comes to this, and my feelings on that were no different. Sometimes sharing feelings about things like that is more difficult than sharing a picture, though, for some reason. And we'll definitely include a link to this in our show notes. Uh, But would you also mind uh, reading and sharing the posts related to your period? Sure. Just like last month and the month before that and the month before that and, okay, you get it, I'll stop. I'm on my period. Here are some highlights from this particular cycle. I spent a whole day lying in bed with the lights off. I bled through a jumbo tampon in a matter of hours. I got blood all over my bathroom floor when I stepped out of the shower, and I canceled plans with a friend because my insides felt like they had sprouted a million tiny knives that were stabbing me. I made a post before where I mentioned feeling beautiful, strong, and powerful during my period. This is still true, but my periods have never in my life been easy. They're painful and messy, and I get cramps and headaches, and I bleed a whole hell of a lot. But they also force me to slow down, pay attention to my body, and to let someone else take care of me for a day. 
They remind me that I'm vulnerable and at the same time so very strong. They remind me that my body is amazing and fascinating and capable of so many wonderful things. They remind me that it's okay to cry or ask for help or ask for an extra hug that day. They also remind me that people all around me are suffering every single day from things that I don't know about. Maybe they're on their period too or have a migraine or are fighting a debilitating disease. Maybe they've just lost a loved one or have a sick child at home. The people around all of us are dealing with things that hurt them all the time, mentally and physically, but I know that so often I forget about that and I think it's all about me. If I'm okay, they're okay. I don't need extra help or empathy. Why do they? So when my body reminds me what pain feels like or what it's like to spend a day feeling vulnerable and scared, it helps me remember that everyone else has those days too. And maybe sometimes they need the extra hug or a kind word or a little bit of help. And being reminded of that is a really good thing. Thanks. I really, you know, I really thought that that was very well put and I appreciate you reading that. So I have to ask, what's what's next for you in this project? I mean, it feels like it's uh, become something bigger than you um, even imagined. Well, as far as what comes next, I honestly have no idea. It started as just a simple, funny project and evolved into this strange and exciting platform from which I can talk about my body and hopefully help people out. Ideally, I want to break away from the Tumblr platform and direct more people to the website instead. I feel like Tumblr is kind of insular and has a really limited demographic, and I'd like to stand outside of that and let more people see what I'm doing and find out about it who don't necessarily have Tumblr accounts. I started a website with no idea what to put on it, and somehow that's evolved into a combination of Tumblr posts and also some extra information, posts, etc. Sometimes I think to myself, I should just stop. I've done enough. This is it. I have nothing left to say. And I don't post anything for a few days. And then all of a sudden I realize I have another thing to say and I write about it and people respond to it and it kindles that desire to keep doing it. Ultimately, I have no idea. I wanted to stop at day 50, then again at day 75, and then again at day 100. And somehow I just keep going. But never once have I really known where I'm going with it. It just happens, and I keep ending up wherever it takes me. Sometimes it's just best to let things develop on their own and see where they take you. Uh, I know I appreciate what you have to say and believe it's a conversation that's needed out there. Listen, I feel like we've only touched the surface here. There's so many things that we could discuss. Uh, Perhaps we'll reconnect in the future for part two. But as you know, many of the listeners on this podcast are, are either naturists or interested in trying social nudity out. Um, often to overcome their own fears and body issues. issues. Uh, Do you have any thoughts for either? Definitely. I'd be happy to come back for a part two someday. Honestly, I think my advice to those people would to just do it. I mean, what (laughs) have you got to lose? I would say that 99% of the time, we're our own worst critic. And that thing, whatever it is, weight, hair, whatever, that is so enormous to us is really not a big deal to a lot of other people. Mm Mm-hmm. I think that everybody should learn to be comfortable naked by themselves and in front of a stranger. Obviously, everybody has different comfort levels, and I can't really make a statement to know what's best for people, but I've never heard anything bad come from a person who had tried out being naked. I don't think it tends to make anyone feel worse about their bodies if they're coming from a place of already feeling bad. Right. It's similar to a lot of questions I get from people where they tell me how amazing I am and how brave and how there's no way they could do what I do. And my answer is an honest, confused, why not? Anyone can do what I do. Anyone can get naked. Anyone can talk about it. Go to a nude beach, post a picture of their body here on the internet, make a blog post about how difficult their period is. People judge themselves so harshly and are so afraid of what everyone else will think we've only got one shot at life and I think it's so important to just do what it is that you want to do because you don't get another chance eventually we'll all die and no one is going to remember if we did that one thing that one time and one person made a snide remark that's not what's going to matter so I guess in a short answer (laughs) the best way to get over things is by just doing them I couldn't agree more Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day to speak with us. Uh, How can our listeners find out more about your project? It was my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. They can check out my website, which is beartobush.com, B-A-R-E-T-O-B-U-S-H.com, 
or follow the Tumblr blog, which is beartobush.tumblr.com. I also have an email address, which I don't mind them contacting me at if they have anything they want to share with me, but I can't guarantee I'll respond to every email. I do get a pretty substantial amount of them. Okay, so what's that? That can be found at beartobush at gmail.com. Great. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. So thank you, Joshua, for being a contributor to the show. And uh, Joshua has actually done another interview and is planning to do more. So you can look forward to some regular contribution from Joshua. So that's all for this episode of The Naturist Living Show. Thank you for listening. And um, again, uh, my name is Stéphane Deschain, and I'm your host for this podcast and the owner of Bear Oaks Family Nature Spark. You can find links to all the items I mentioned in the show notes on the website at naturistliving, one word, naturistliving, dot bear oaks, B-A-R-E, of course, bear oaks, dot C-A, because we are in Canada. Keep sending your comments and suggestions. Always appreciate reading them. The show's email address is naturistliving at bearoaks.ca. Join us again in about a month for the next episode of The Naturist Living Show. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca. 